Ready to level B. And we are rolling. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third episode of Active Measures. I'm here with Kit Clarenberg, well-known agent of the crown. Oh, God. <laughs> um, Curses! Foiled again. No. We, we want to extend a special thank you to everyone who has been supporting us on Substack. Uh, we have a Patreon that is launching. It's not quite ready yet. Um, but again, thank you so much, uh, guys. As always, please like and subscribe to our videos on YouTube. Follow us and retweet us on Twitter. And let's start the show. Kit, you have been doing amazing work on Macedonia. North thank you. Macedonia. Or is it South? Or is it, or, or is it the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia? Right. Okay, so um, there is something of a counter-revolution at hand um, in Macedonia, or North Macedonia, or Phyrom, um, as as we shall see. Its name is contentious, uh, contentious issue. So <clears throat> on May eighth, um, the anti-NATO, anti-EU party VMRO DPMNE. Um, I shall refer to them as VMRO um, hereafter. They scored a very clear, if not landslide, victory in both presidential and parliamentary elections. Uh, Gordana uh, Silvianovska Davkova is now Macedonia's very first female president. She resoundingly beat the pro Western incumbent Stevo Pandorovsky of the ruling Social Democrats. Um, Pendrovsky is a, a darling of EU and US officials. Um, he won in what was regarded as a bit of an upset in 2019. And this was hailed in the West, Western media as uh, a demonstration of, of Macedonians yearning to at last become members of the transatlantic community and rejection of VMRO's uh, anti-Western um, politics. They're not particularly anti-Western, but they did oppose uh, the country joining both the EU and NATO. So therefore, they are evil pro-Russian pawns. Um, and so, uh, in effect, his presidency removed the last remaining barrier to Macedonia joining um, NATO, which was opposed by a significant proportion of the local population um, uh, for a variety of reasons. And it, the process by which the country entered NATO was, was very protracted and bitter and controversial. But um, it, it, in effect, this is a huge blow to, to NATO um, and, and the EU and, and the US empire as well. Um, I have been to Macedonia many times. I, I urge uh, viewers to, to travel themselves. It's a very beautiful country, amazing food, really nice people. Um, but they, it, it, for, it, it was formerly a component of Yugoslavia and a republic uh, thereof. And after 1991, when Yugoslavia disintegrated due to US meddling, um, it, uh, its name suddenly became deeply controversial because of course, Greece, there is a territory, well, it's actually part of modern day Bulgaria, but uh, the, 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 the Greece claims the name and the term Macedonia as part of its an antiquity. This is where Alexander the Great hailed from. And so when Macedonia became a independent quote unquote country, um, suddenly Athens was rather worried that Macedonia would make claims on its own territory and would seek to um, what's the word, appropriate um, the name for itself, um, therefore undermining its history and, um, uh, it, it, um, funnily enough, a lot of its uh, kind of tourism pull. So Greece struck a deal with Macedonia whereby it, they, um, when Macedonia joined the UN, say, it would be called Phyrom, so the former Yugoslav Republic of, of Macedonia. That would be its its formal name. Um, fast forward to 2008, and Greece outright blocked Macedonia joining the bloc um, on the basis of its name, and they yeah. suggested that you rename your they, they suggested you will rename yourselves New Macedonia or Upper Macedonia. Sure. Um, it has to, the name has to be changed. Um, this was opposed by something like 80 plus percent of the public. Um, people residing in Macedo Macedonia have referred to themselves as Macedonians for centuries, um, and that the, the it, it has been the uh, the territory has been known under that name um, since the creation of, of Yugoslavia. So um, it, it, this presented a very real problem uh, for a very long time. VMRO were in power, and they were opposed to joining the EU and NATO. So of course, um, from their perspective, uh, there were they, they were never going to change 
their name um and um uh, th there was yes a significant proportion of the public who um, took that view as well um post kind of maidan and post um the reunification of uh, crimea with russia um nato started quite aggressively pushing for expansion in the former yugoslavia because they understood that there was probably a limited amount of time before russia responded to this um in one way or another so um they st started aggressively pushing for macedonia to join um nato um in 2015 the, the Social Democrats, uh, the opposition at the time, um, they started uh, releasing kind of bombshell audio recordings, which seemed to to indicate that the ruling party was involved in a, a, a wide variety of crimes and misdeeds and an abuse of power. Um, there are some suggestions that this material was handed to them by the CIA and MI6, um, because that's what they do. Um, but, 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 but I mean, this created a political crisis. Um, which in 2017 led to the election of the Social Democrats. And so since then, it, the country has basically been ruled by ve very pro-Western mm -hmm. puppets, yeah. basically. So this, and there was all sorts, in order to get into NATO, um, there was all sorts of skullduggery where they, they bribed um, MPs, they blackmailed, blackmailed others, and they had a, a kind of sham referendum, yeah. which under the terms of... Um, uh, Macedonia's constitution um, was basically illegal, um, wh whereby people would vote on the new name. Now, 94% voted in favour, although the turnout was absolutely tiny. Sure. So yeah. it was illegitimate, but they went ahead with it anyway. And there were that huge. That was about 2017. Yeah, yeah. And there were these huge street protests um, under the banner of Never North, Always Macedonia. Um, and uh, it, 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 the adoption of, of, of this new name is a major sticking point for a lot of the public. Um, but I mean, interesting, I hear from sources on the ground there, um, including um, opposition journalists, that <clears throat> in effect, once Macedonia was kind of shunted into NATO, which occurred, formally the accession occurred in, in, in March 2020, the US stopped paying attention um, as did Britain, um, which we'll get into in a moment. But in effect, since then, it's kind of been, well, you're in now, so we're just going mm -hmm. to leave you be. Um, we made and, a mess and we're going to sweep it under the rug. Yeah, but, but also as well, it's like they got what they want, ultimately sure. wanted. So like uh, once that's achieved, because I mean, contrary to NATO's public claims that countries are free to choose their own security arrangements, you know, actually, um, once you're in NATO, it is very, very difficult to leave and there will be consequences if you even attempt it um, yeah. this is this is exactly what happened in Montenegro which um, I've written about this but uh, in 2016 there was a allegedly failed coup um, where the government claimed that a team of Russian intelligence operatives along with the the pro-Russian pro-Serb opposition um, had attempted to were seeking to overthrow the government and um, this uh, this was a stage managed false flag that was always intended to fail while discrediting the pro-Russian opposition. Um, and then the second that Montenegro was or, uh, was forced into NATO despite 80% of the public opposing it, um, then they just decided to leave it alone. Um, because, you know, like job done, etc. But the, I mean, the, the, the election of um, Gordana um, is a really, it couldn't have come at a worse time from yeah. NATO's perspective because, um, I mean, we've had the election of Robert Fico in Slovakia, who is openly anti-war, anti anti-sanctions, uh, and, and indeed anti-NATO. So one by one, like dominoes, um, these countries are, are falling. Um, it sounds like West Africa. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Which and we'll and talk just a think, bit about later, just really quickly, like if you could draw this up. So for for several years, um, Britain's ambassador to Macedonia was an individual called Charles Garrett. Um, I've heard from a number of sources um, on the ground that I mean, so in in as part of this kind of color revolution that the West foisted on Macedonia in 2016, 2017 which was tied in with the release of those audio intercepts, um, there was a large number of civil society organisations and NGOs that were 
allegedly anti-corruption, pro-democracy, etc. I have heard that Charles Garrett, the uh, British ambassador, was was going from office to office in Skopje, the, the capital of uh, Macedonia, and handing out cash from his diplomatic pouch, yeah. um, which is, you know, this is how diplomats carry things, and they're not, you're not allowed to go into it. No. <laughs> like, yeah, you're not it allowed to, yeah, 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 it has immunity. And I mean, this was one of the ways that uh, the Ecuadorian intelligence services were thinking of getting Assange right. out of the embassy that they were going to put him in a diplomatic bag and just smuggle him out that way. Um, so uh, sadly, it never came to pass. And now he is, um, it, it's, I think he's been in, for, it's five years now, isn't it, um, that he's been in Belmarsh, poor, right. poor Julian. But, but, but yeah, so in effect, um, Charles Garrett was handing out cash to all of these organisations that uh, were subsequently involved in the, uh, the colour revolution. And then another component of the colour revolution was there was, and if you could bring up the BBC article now, there was an individual called uh, Katica Yeneva. Um, and so she was built the real up... real crime-fighting yeah, No, no, no. I mean, this is, this is like, it, it is beautiful. So, I mean, yeah, if you could just kind of scroll down this very slowly. Right, so uh, Katica uh, was um, a prosecutor and um, she became a very prominent figure within Macedonia's colour revolution. And she, uh, her, she was framed in the Western media as the face of the new Macedonia. And so she was uh, uh, tasked with investigating all of the corruption and criminality that was exposed via the release of these wiretaps. Um, and again, this is almost certainly passed on to uh, the opposition by the CIA and MI6. I mean, where else did they get it? Um, and so uh, she, yes, there are all of these fawning profiles in the Western media and this BBC article refers to her and her two uh, subordinates as as Charlie's angels, like you know these these real life crime fighters. Um, uh, fast forward a bit, and she ended up in jail for corruption, um, like very, like rather amusingly, because she was taking bribes and bungs to uh, for selective prosecutions, leaving certain people alone and pursuing other individuals. Now, um, if you the uh, if we could draw up the photo of her with um, with Mr. Charles Barrett. Yeah, I got it up. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty fucking hilarious, isn't it? Um, so this is the the guy on the the right of the picture is uh, is Charles is is Charles Garrett, um, rather skeletal, uh, kooky looking figure. But don't underestimate him. Um, and he wrote an he wrote an article for the, the British government's uh, website where he effectively stated that his job in in Macedonia was to get um, the country into NATO, um, and he succeeded in that. Um, subsequent to this, he became the British ambassador to Kyrgyzstan, and almost immediately after taking the post, there was a coup. In, uh, so this not rather, yeah, rather does seem to, to follow Mr. Garrett around. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's just a, a, a spooky coincidence. I, I'm, yes, in, in the um, uh, parliament written evidence that I've included in the document, he talks about watching the, the coup in Kyrgyzstan firsthand, um, and again, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 questions can only be asked about why. Yes, why uh, wherever he goes, governments tend to get destabilized. Uh, there are some local media reporting in Macedonia about how he um, uh, was on the board of an alleged charitable organization which was seeking investment for the creation of new housing in Macedonia, and it, of course, this would have netted him a lot of money. So he had a personal stake in uh, corrupt dealings um, and quote unquote democratization in um, in post socialist Macedonia. Um, speaking of corruption and foreign money and color revolutions. And we're on to Georgia then. So last week we covered a good amount of the background on the ongoing color revolution in Georgia. Today I want to cover a little bit more of what's actually happening now and I starting this off with a uh, search through the NED's grant database mm -hmm. for the country of Georgia. And we have between 2016 and 2020, $10,455,373 from the NED in those four years. And this is just what they're advertising. And this, this is, is just, just what, they're, what advertising. they're advertising. This is solely the NED. It's not USAID. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, as... Uh, the Left East article that we talked about last week pointed out some 90% of the NGOs in Georgia receive foreign funding. Yes. So what 
I wanted to do is um, talk about first the shame movement, which has been getting uh, significant funding from the NED. It's if, getting more now. Is it's it getting right? more? Is that right? Yeah. But then, I mean, just 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 really quickly, sure. like as a as a just as a background, when um, unrest in Georgia erupted at the start of last year because over the the government's push to pass this legislation that would compel um, f uh, NGOs to disclose their sources of funding, um, and uh, the the US was quite clearly extremely irate and was basically demanding that they they not pass this because it was not in keeping with the future we have decided for uh, for little georgia um the shame movement was at the forefront of this now a, a, a kind of a cool party trick um if you go to awful parties is to whenever there's a protest in the news mm. look at the look at the group's name named in mm. reporting and then look at the NED grant database because almost invariably, I mean, like ninety nine point nine percent of the time, they will be in there. Yeah. Now, I when yeah when this unrest uh, erupted last year, I looked at the reporting and the shame movement were widely quoted. And of course, you just it's like one degree of separation. I have an article it, up here. Uh, Georgia shame. This is Radio Free Europe. Yes. Radio Liberty. Uh, U.S. propaganda. U.S. Yeah. Fund propaganda. Yeah. And I, I might I, I might I might add as well that the the shame movement their official role well i mean the official, their official like kind of task for the ned is specifically to scrutinize legislation passed by georgia dream the ruling party so it, it, by token of um stirring up trouble around this they are explicitly doing their job that they are paid yeah, to do by and, the us it, government it's funny you use the word trouble because the headline on radio free europe is georgia's shame movement is getting protesters out on the streets but is it enough to trouble the government? So it's very the clear, very clear implication here is that uh, the goal is to trouble the government. Mm. Um, and if you go to the, this is Georgian, but let me just translate it really quickly. Go to the uh, resource section on the Shame yeah. Movement website. We have, yeah. if a policeman stopped you on the street, if a policeman takes a picture of you, if the police arrested you, if the police arrested you again, uh, if, and if the police ask you at home, I don't. That's like not a great translation, but it's very clear that the shame movement is uh, dedicated to you know unrest in the streets. Mm. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to talk about is some of the parliamentary leaders yes. of the ongoing. Um, unrest. Trouble. Yeah, yes. but just I mean, just really Go quickly, ahead, yeah. just really quickly as well. Like I think that it, it, it is important to note, and that excellent Left East article that we shared in our last um, uh, broadcast. The, the, it's important to note that there is a a huge organic element to this unrest. Like it's not being fully controlled and directed from overseas because Georgians um, have it, support for joining the EU is overwhelming. Um, amongst the Georgian public, and they do believe, and we can discuss why why they believe this, but they, they do believe wrongly, probably, that this will interfere with their EU membership. I mean, that's what US and EU officials are threatening. Although, yes. as we noted last time, the EU is mulling almost identical legislation, um, which would, they would Georgia would have to adopt anyway when yeah. they joined. So it's quite it's quite bizarre. But but there there is a huge organic component to this. The NGOs are not at the forefront pro uh, of the unrest, probably because it would be very bad optics. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah, it, it's important to note that it, this this isn't purely orchestrated from abroad, or that is yeah. a component of it. Like yes. Um and, 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 and you know, as as we've discussed previously, you know, the the funding that comes from abroad allows for like funding at all allows for movements to actually happen rather than just people being discontented at home. Mm. Uh, the funding is what uh, what makes for for an actual um, movement. Um, you can't do it without it. Uh, so um, I wanted to talk about the leaders yes. of. The, 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 the political leaders of, mm. of this movement, not so much the students or, or the youth, what have you. Um, and I have here an article in Politico EU um, about the, well, which it mentions um, Georgia's president, 
uh, Georgia's president, and I'm going to butcher all of the names that come um, because I I'm not very familiar with the Georgian language. But no. we have <laughs> we have Salome Zurubichvili. Uh, so according to she's the, and she's um, she's with the opposition. She is not with yes. the Georgia Dream, the prime minister's party. She's with the opposition. She is the president of the country. This is a situation which could very easily escalate into a civil war and open up a, another front against Russia, yeah. uh, as we discussed last time. Georgian leader Salome uh, Zurubishvili, uh, who topped off a brilliant career at Paris's Science Po with a second master's degree from Columbia, supervised supervised by Brzezinski. Um, Zygmunt, so, yes. And, then- and I have... Um, well, you know, she was the uh, French ambassador to the country of Chad because she was born in France and educated in France. Yes. Um, and she, she, I mean, I think it's important to add as well that, like, it's quite clear that she doesn't speak Georgian very well. Think, like, and yeah. she, she has a very bizarre accent when she talks. So it's like, I mean, this is this is colonial governor stuff, yeah. really. And she, I mean, she, she used to be part of the, the White House press team as yeah. well when she worked, what, what was it, Reuters or, or Associated? Something like that, I don't know. Yeah, maybe Reuters. But uh, she's a longtime French diplomat. Uh, and, and I mean, she, uh, she, a UN official as well. I think she was on um, a committee of like uh, uh, dedicated to Iranian sanctions. Yes. Um, and uh, as, as she was stationed in the African country of Chad, uh, they had a coup supported by her government, the French mm-hmm. government. Um, which brought in a warlord by the name of Idris Deby, who has been accused of widespread political killing, systematic torture, and thousands of arbitrary arrests by Human Rights Watch. Uh, Emmanuel Macron is, of course, a big supporter of Idris Deby and his mm, son, Mohammed, uh, who is the current leader of Chad, and um, actually sat next to, let me pull it up, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron and Chad's new head of state, Mohamed Idris Deby, uh, were seen sitting side by side at the state funeral of Chad's longtime ruler, Idris Deby. Um, so that's just a little bit of background on, um, on the president. Uh, then we have in parliament, we have Georgi Vashadze, uh, Harvest Business School Executive Education. Um, yeah. he, uh, he has given an ultimatum to the government to basically accept their demands or be shut down. Um, he is known as, well, he started a think tank called the Innovation and Development Foundation, the IDF, no coincidence, <laughs> no, no relation. That's ridiculous. Um, That's ridiculous. But this is a guy who uh, has been at the forefront in both uh, Georgia and Ukraine of e-governments, um, mm. biometric passports, uh, online portals for government services, this kind of thing. Mm. Uh, here he is giving a talk at uh, on, on civic tech in Ukraine and Georgia. Um, during his career, uh, Georgi Vashadze has initiated and implemented many technology reforms in government, most notably the Public Service Hall, an agency of the Georgian government, which provides a variety of public services, including biometric passports, ID cards, digital signatures, a citizen portal, and unified demographic registries. Um, so, and, and again, he is a, uh, a, a main leader of um, the opposition in Georgia and has been delivering ultimatums to the government. Uh, next we have, here he is, Georgi Vashidze, Vashadze, uh, <laughs> serving as an expert to Petro Poroshenko, the former president of Ukraine, who, yes. interestingly enough, um, do you know what his nickname is? What? It's uh, he's like he's like the chocolate bandit or something because <laughs> because he made his wealth. Petro, a lot of people don't know this. Petro Poroshenko made his wealth by privatizing the Karl Marx confectionery. Oh yeah, no, I, no, no, I'm, I'm I'm aware of the privatization. I I, I, um, I know you are, but most, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. But I mean, the chocolate bandit. Um, it's, it's something like. I that, mean, yeah. this is. I mean, Poroshenko is of course now on a wanted list. Um, right. He has been. Uh, yeah, the, an arrest warrant has been issued by Russia. I mean, what that means for him, we shall see, I suppose. Uh, it, 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 as much as I loathe uh, bombing campaigns, I mean, the pictures of him cowering in the Kiev subway 
uh, the guy who boasted about how our children will go to school and theirs yeah, will right. work in the basements. It's a bit like, so it goes. Yeah. So it goes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, yeah he, him and some other people from the uh, think tank, uh, the in an Innovation and Development Foundation briefing, Poroshenko here. Uh, what do we have next? Who else do we have? We have Nika Gavaramia, <laughs> the founder of a Georgia television, television station that received significant foreign funding. So again, vested interest in the transparency law not yes. passed. In November 2023, Gavari was awarded the Interna International Press Freedom Award by the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is an Omidyar uh, operation. Yes. Uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists is uh, funded by... Uh, by uh, Piero Midyar, the owner of The Intercept, the uh, founder of PayPal, uh, basically a media and tech oligarch yeah. that I've reported on uh, quite a bit over the years. Um, in August 2023, the Ukrainian parliament ordered, uh, awarded uh, Nika Gavaramia a prestigious medal for his service to the Ukrainian people. Who do we have next? We have another never ending, uh, a never ending list. Leader. Well, I want to go through the parliamentary leaders of, yeah. uh, of the Georgian opposition sure, sure. just to show their background because I think it's very important. And here's one, a uh, guy by the name of Alexander Elisha Svili, who, uh, has, uh, who joined the uh, International Legion in Ukraine as a mercenary. This uh, legion has been exposed by, I think it was the Kiev Independent, very pro-Kiev uh, publication. I think they even received funding mm. from... Uh, the Canada's version of the National Endowment for Democracy, but they, they expose the International Legion as uh, basically a hotbed of corruption and abuse. Um, this Georgian MP fought with them, um, and more recently he fought with another member of parliament. Here he is punching uh, the basically the equivalent of the House Speaker in Georgia in the face during a session over the transparency law. Um, what else do we have? We have um, okay, so yeah, here we go. Pre-election environment in Georgia. Okay, so what we have now is a Georgian Parliament's Foreign Relations Committee delegation reviews cooperations reforms with IFES and USAID officials in Washington. So this has flown entirely under the radar. I've not seen a single report on this in the mainstream media of the Georgian delegation to Washington, D.C., uh, May 3rd of this year. Um, the pre-election environment in Georgia and the domestic bill on transparency of foreign influence were discussed on Thursday in a meeting between a delegation of Georgia's Parliament, Parliament's Foreign Relations Committee, Anthony Bur ba Banbury, the president of the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, and Alexander Sokolowski, the deputy assistant administrator of the United States Agency for International Development Bureau for Europe and Eurasia. The meeting focused on USAID-backed projects in Georgia, the role of IFES in electoral reforms in the country, and the prospects of the European Union opening accession talks with Georgia, the Georgian parliament said. Led by the committee chair, Nicholas Sankaradze, <laughs> the delegation is the official is an, on an official visit to Washington to discuss bilateral relations and cooperations with U.S. officials. So as protests take over the streets on a daily basis mm. in Tbilisi, capital of Georgia, there is a delegation meeting in private with Washington that has received absolutely zero media coverage. One, one other thing that has not received significant media coverage is this video unlisted on YouTube by the National Endowment for Democracy, a message to Georgians from the chairman and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy, Damon Wilson. I'm going to play it now. Yeah. For a few weeks, We've been in the news quite a bit in Georgia. But you and I know this was never really about Ned. The actions this week show that it's about you. It's about Georgians who love their country, support democracy, and know Georgia is part of Europe. So this week, in the wake of horrendous assaults on peaceful protesters, I wanted to reach out directly to say, thank you. We support you. We admire you. And so many Georgians turned out to protest your parliament's consideration of the Russian-inspired foreign agents law. As that was happening, a delegation from Georgia's parliament visited Washington this week. The delegation began our discussion here at NED by noting its intent to 
put flesh on the bones of the U.S.-Georgia strategic partnership, as they put it. We were a bit incredulous. As just minutes before, we heard Bedzina Ivanishvili's chilling remarks to the Georgian people, where he demonized and dehumanized patriotic Georgians who work in support of their communities, promise violence against the political opposition, and attack Georgia's closest friends and allies. Far from strengthening the U.S.-Georgian relationship, the government seems intent on ripping the flesh away from it. So at the same time that the government moves to break the bonds of friendship with its allies, it has displayed a brazen willingness to move against you, its own people. We've watched as riot police and special forces have mercilessly beaten citizens and detained them, used violence against peaceful protesters. It's a sad time in Georgia. First, for all the Georgians who believe in a democratic Georgia anchored in Europe. It's also a sad time for all of Georgia's many friends who have invested so much over the years in all of you, in our relationships and in the Georgian people. We have gladly given Georgia our energy and support because of your remarkable determination to forge a democracy in a difficult region, to indelibly link your country's destiny with the West, to claim unabashedly and unapologetically your ambition for European Union and NATO membership. It's your energy, animation, and determination that has captured the imaginations of so many Americans, myself included. And despite the kinship we feel with you, we know we've let you down in the past. 2008 is a dark stain for many of us, for me personally. But the failures of our... So I think that's enough of that. Do you have any final thoughts on Georgia? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it just strikes me that in effect, the, 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 it's a game of chicken um, now because it's like the EU and US have poured so much energy and vitriol yeah. into opposing this that they almost they can't let them go ahead with it but then so the Georgian government has two so I mean we saw it's yeah like, some cost fallacy yeah this. yeah and it's like and I think that yeah they are well aware that this could produce a domino effect and emulation um, elsewhere uh, other countries adopting similar um, legislation. So um, yes, it is. Uh, I, I gather from um, comrades on the ground in, in Georgia that it, the, the situation is pretty tense, um, and quite what's going to happen next isn't clear. Um, uh, again, I, we shall see. I suppose um, the like m like m more 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 generally. Um, I think that the, it, the, it, 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 we've spoken about how this is orga largely organic. Like we discussed last week, it, there is a a kind of um, there, there's a there. What would you call it? There's a ripple effect. Like so, when you fund all of these organisations and all of these causes, um, then uh, they will carry on doing. They will carry on doing yeah, their work for you. Yeah, the, yeah. The liberal identity, opposition identity. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, and I think that particularly, um, and I think we'll, we'll get into this um, in a moment. Uh, that that a lot of these groups that receive foreign funding because they have U.S. officials in their ears and they are often earning considerably more than the average wage, like in these countries they feel a bit special and a bit bulletproof and like there are no consequences and hey we can do whatever we want because ultimately the us or and or the eu will ultimately come to the rescue if we're in trouble so there is i mean that's another aspect of just not being able to back that's down like the ukrainian style yeah. yeah yeah and it's i mean it's we we saw this in in serbia at the end of last year where their opposition protests i mean they had signs uh, the, the the there were many protesters that had signs written in English that were obviously not for domestic consumption that that set, saying quite literally please help us US EU and they thought that it would be forthcoming. Um, but I mean on the subject of a, a, a culture of impunity, um, there is a rather remarkable article from Not Us or Notus um, about widespread sexual harassment um, in. National Endowment for Democracy funded uh, <clears throat> human rights and democracy groups in China, or at least organizations that talk a lot about human rights and democracy in China. Um, this includes the Uyghur World Congress um, and the Hong Kong Democracy Council. I mean, these are US based 
uh, exile advocacy groups. Um, the the former, the the Uyghur World Congress. I think it was launched in two thousand and four. This is when the National Endowment for Democracy, which its own founders concede, does publicly what the CIA used to do covertly, started funneling um, millions and millions to. Uh, we, 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 Uyghur, Uyghur uh, separatist and independence groups. Um, they have, a partic well, particularly under the Trump administration, they pushed the narrative that China was committing genocide in Yingyang and they um, uh, used a complete lunatic and Christian fascist called Adrian Zenz for, for, for the purpose. Um, they, this is part of a nexus of human rights organizations and media operations that um, uh, are avowedly anti-communist and they, put, they have pushed this narrative that the China is trying to erase the, the Uyghur people. Um, concurrent to this, the US has frequently clashed with Uyghur militants in Afghanistan. Um, they were, there were a large number of them um, went to fight in Syria as well alongside ISIS um, and they uh, they talked about how they wanted to uh, gain experience fighting Assad in order to fight Chinese authorities and uh, bathe in the blood of Han Chinese and remove all non-Turkic because the, the Uyghurs are Turkic people from um, Yingyang. This would of course include the Mongolians who have been there for a lot longer than they have. Um, so uh, that aspect of it doesn't feature in the media at all um, and it's what's quite interesting is that the NED funding for these operations in, uh, came a year after um, uh, a long time CIA operative called Graham E. Fuller wrote a book called The Yin Yang Problem mm -hmm. where he talked about how Yin Yang um, posed a very very difficult um, uh, it was a very difficult issue for the for Chinese authorities and how its uh, geographic position meant that it was effectively a uh, it was a means of of invading China like yeah. because of where it's it, well the first uh, <laughs> I believe this the the first CIA spying post was in Yingyang. yeah yeah because it's on it's on it's on the border with Central Asia and it's it is a key means by which China sends and receives goods. Like it's a key trading yeah. area, but also um, it would be in a very effective um, uh, uh, front door for any invasion of China. And so Graham Fuller in this in this book again called the Yin Yang problem um, stated that we should um, uh, certainly consider playing the the Uyghur card as a means of exerting pressure on China in the event of some future crisis many of China's rivals have in the past pursued active policies in Yin Yang and exploited the Uyghur issue sorry the Uyghur issue for their benefit the possibility cannot be excluded from any survey of possible longer range futures for the Yin Yang issue um, and elsewhere in the text Fuller writes about how that the Uyghurs are in are in contact with uh, extremist groups, and some have been radicalised, um, etc. So um, it's quite possible that the the uh, the Uyghur insurgency, which the Chinese government was fighting from the late nineties until twenty seventeen, um, uh, was uh, being run by the CIA in the manner of uh, the, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, or indeed the Mujahideen in Bosnia um, in the nineties. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a a very murky web. But um, particularly under the Trump administration, there was an enormous um, uh, push to uh, uh, there was an enormous push to to promulgate this narrative that a ge a targeted genocide of Uyghurs was being conducted by China yeah. in Yingyang because they were Uyghurs, um, and this in involved the construction of of camps, uh, re-education camps uh, for Uyghurs, which were framed as kind of concentration camps, like yeah. death camps, yeah. when actually they were being taught um, uh, man man Mandar yeah. Mandarin and yeah. communist theory. Um, and they were they were put there against their will um, and they couldn't leave, which is, you know, not great. But yeah, uh, I mean, they weren't allowed it, to have beards either. But I mean, this, yeah. this, you know, you have to understand this in the context of yeah. Uh, frequent suicide bombings yes. hitting Uyghur populations by other Uyghurs, um, hmm. you know, rap, rap yeah, world. yeah. I mean, there, there were hundreds of attacks and thousands of thousands of people yeah. died, and they were overwhelmingly Uyghurs. So yeah. it was a very serious issue which the Chinese government dealt with heavy-handedly because that's how you would. In a very U.S. style. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and fun, yeah. funnily enough, that the um, China's policies on 
on how to deal with radicalization were informed by Israeli and British right. um, notions. So um, people ended up getting sent to camps because they expressed an opinion or said something that was judged to be indicative of uh, extremist views. Um, it's the same in the UK where you have uh, children who wear Palis uh, Palestine solidarity badges who get uh, referred to something known as prevent and then the police come knocking at their door and harassing their parents and, and accusing them of raising a terror a potential terrorist. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, yeah, the, I, I think that the, the, this seems to have been um, rolled up now. Like they, 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 they no longer operate camps and they've removed a lot of the security measures which were around the yin-yang, which were concerned with preventing attacks from neighbouring countries. Um, sure. Uh, the, the, uh, so, uh, and the, um, the US and the EU have also sanctioned um, yin yang to damage um, employability uh, locally, but yeah, the, I mean, w one thing that's quite interesting is, and if you could draw up the, the Covert Action magazine article, um, I wrote about this two more than two years ago now. Um, the, uh, the, the, the there is a popular Uyghur uh, podcast called Uyghur W E G -E Stories, um, which is funded by the French Embassy. Um, in in the US and um, it's run by uh, the host is a longtime CIA operative who was working for the agency during the the war on terror um, and it's it, it appears played a role in the production of Zero Dark Thirty and Argo. These are two. CIA propaganda films that were up against each other for a number of industry kind of Hollywood awards, um, which were both basically written by the CIA um, and led to official inquiries because of the extremely incestuous, intimate relationship between the agency and the filmmakers, which included giving each other gifts and, and then all sorts of other things. So he was in he was in the agency. He was in the post while these. The, it's called Entertainment Liaison in this post while these two movies were made and then fast forward to today and he's now making uh, a Uyghur advocacy podcast um, and is apparently deeply concerned about the suffering of Muslims worldwide. I might add Argo is a deeply Islamophobic racist film that portrays Iranians um, as backwards violent savages and Zero Dark Thirty um, heavily implies to the point of outright stating that the CIA torture program helped capture Bin Laden. Um, which is a lie, yeah. and even John McCain, um, that well-known, uh, the warm, Duff, um, the, yeah. yeah, that well-known, uh, that well-known uh, peacenik, um, stated that this was absolutely disgusting yeah. that they were doing this. So because the torture program elicited no useful intelligence whatsoever, yeah. it was very, it was very nonetheless useful to generate. Uh, false intelligence that they could, such as oh, the, the, the Iraq was behind 9/11, which could be used to justify the invasion and and and, and all sorts of other uh, belligerent f uh, the f actions abroad. But yeah, so he's not. Funnily enough, he's not the only um, former CIA operative who's involved in uh, pro Uyghur. Uh, activism. Well, the deep state. Oh, well, yeah, the deep state. So there's another um, a woman called Russian Abbas who um, she uh, is a former translator for the American government. And Tra translator in quotes because I, you know, if it's something like seventy thousand translators in Afghanistan. They have a, yes. they have a sitcom in the U.S. called uh, United States of Al. That's about an Afghan translator. Um, everyone seems to be translators in the war on terror. Yes. Um, and I, they needed a, a, an unusually large mm. amount of them in Guantanamo Bay. Yes, indeed, indeed. And so um, there is a Reddit, uh, Ask Me Anything, that she did, where she was asked about her, her service in the US government, and she admitted that she was a quote-unquote translator for the 22 Uyghur inmates in Guantanamo Bay. Um, and she suggested that they had a better life in Guantanamo Bay than they would have had in Ying Yang. Um, I mean, horrific, really. Yeah. And she also... Being force-fed hummus up the... Of the anus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, amongst other, you know, absolutely brutal torture methods that the CIA used. And she was part of this very strange and seemingly shut down um, company called ISA, uh, sorry, ISI Consultants, um, which seems to have not really done anything and then vanished. Um, and its it, its website has been deleted and, and all sorts of other things. I mean, I would imagine this is a CIA front. But these are the kind of people and who... What's her organization? Is, is she the Uyghur Human Rights Campaign? Yeah, like, yeah. And she claims, that, she, claims that rel she claims that relatives of hers have been... Been yeah. disappeared by, chi by China. Yeah, I mean, it's like the, there's 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 a term that 
is applied to um, uh, anti-CPC activists, which is, uh, I'm a Uyghur genocide survivor, and yet they killed no one. So, I mean, everyone who went through the camp system um, is a survivor and is now equipped with Mandarin. She, so, she's campaigned for Uyghurs as her group. Yes, just, yes. Just and, like, and, and yeah, she, she, she's very, very prominent. But it's just it's very interesting that all of these CIA people who are involved in the war on terror, which was fundamentally about oppressing and slaughtering Muslims, are suddenly deeply concerned about the suffering and alleged genocide of, right. of, of Muslims. Well, China's Jews. taken our job. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you leave, you, yeah, you leave our patch alone. Yeah. Um, that, that they say, but the the point the the point is is yeah that that not us or notice or whatever whatever its name is has written this very extensive investigation into how individuals who are tied to the Uyghur World Congress and other um, U.S. funded advocacy groups <coughs> are involved um, have been white, accused by a number of people of sexual harassment. Um, and uh, sexual impropriety uh, and so I mean I just think that more generally this like we were discussing um, in respect of Georgia um, I, the, the, I think the psychology here is quite clear which is that well when you work for an organization that receives universally positive press coverage where effectively you you, you are li to an extent living a lie because you are talking about how oh christ there's this genocide in yin yang without referencing the fact that oh well there is this very very serious problem with extremist violence and that's actually why it's happening um you you, you, you feel a sense of impunity and you you feel that well the US is always just going to come to the rescue and it, and it, it states that um, uh, the, 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 uh, what, what someone that, that a prominent Uyghur World Congress um, oh sorry World Uyghur Congress um, representative like sexually harassed a number of people and was very sexually suggestive in messaging with them and it, heartbreakingly one of the one of their victims said um, I didn't want people to know their leader is someone like this yeah so they kind of kept shtum about it because they thought it would hurt the cause yeah. um, and. Yeah, um, I, I think that that's probably quite widespread. That like the sense of, uh, well, I can't come forward with with this because it would be it would be counter counterproductive, and actually, like overall, that their, their objective is just therefore yeah. um, they made rationalisations for it. I would imagine that this is very very common. Um, I myself have been libelled. Um, very egregiously by a, a British and American government funded fact checker um, called uh, Detector Media and they published this absolutely insane hit piece on me accusing me of calling for violence against um, Bosniaks the, uh, the, the, the Muslim inhabitants of Bosnia and suggesting that I was a genocide denier and all sorts of other heinous, heinous slander um, I emailed them after I wasn't given a right of reply and I emailed them afterwards um, and asking uh, demanding that they remove this from the internet and their response was well we can do a follow-up article yeah and it's like well I mean quite clearly these people think that they are untouchable yeah and they were probably tasked with doing this by the British and American governments actually yeah. so so just real quick, Dolkin Issa, the president of the World Uyghur Congress, uh, an organization which has received 1.73 million mm. from the NED over the course of four years between 2016 and 2020. Uh, here, in this article, uh, begging a 22-year-old human rights advocate uh, to kiss him um, and attempting to silence her uh, and keep her from telling other people. Um, Ajit Singh in the gray zone has Dolkin Issa. Born, uh, uh, born at the turn of the 20th, oh no, no, here, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. The current president of the uh, World Uyghur Congress is Dolkin Issa, winner of the 2019 Democracy Award from the NED. In 2016, Issa received a Human Rights Award from the Far Rights Victim of Communism Memorial Foundation, which was established by the U.S. government in 1993. In his acceptance speech, Issa emphasized the Uyghur's resistance to communism and that we will not stop our work until we con uh, consign this destruction, destructive ideology in the worlds of Reagan to, quote, the ash heap of history. Uh, Issa regular, regularly lobbies U.S. and Western politi uh, politicians to intensify their new Cold War agenda by enacting economic sanctions and curbing ties with China. Among those, 
He has met with, in recent years, our Trump administration White House officials, right-wing Republican Te uh, Senator Ted Cruz, the U.S. Consul General in Munich, and the fervently anti-China acting director of national intelligence, Richard Grinnell. Um, <laughs> here he is with Grinnell. Who was hanging out in Belgrade, I gather. Grinnell. Oh, yeah, yeah. right. Um, in November 2019, ESA attended the Halifax International Security Forum, a gathering convened by NATO and the Canadian Department of National Defense. There, he met with Western political and military figures. In January 2020, ESA was hosted at an event organized by the Board of Deputies of British Jews, a right-wing British Israeli lobby group. At the event, ESA met with the ultra-Zionist organization B'nai Akiva, whose leader called for the Israeli army to, quote, take the foreskins of 300 Palestinians amid Israel's punishing 2014 assault on the besieged Gaza Strip. Lovely stuff. Yeah, charming, charming it, it guys. It's funny too, you know, the the, pre, uh, the president of the World Uyghur Congress is um, is a sex pest, and the president of the World Ukrainian Congress is a banderite. Yes. Paul Grodd. Of course, um, of course. Both groups supported by the NED, but speaking of... Uh, Sexual harassment. Sexual harassment in the in the human rights industry. Yes. Here we have the Dalai Lama, originally a uh, CIA of, asset of fund, huge funds from the CIA, now a recipient of huge funds from the National Endowment for Democracy, mm. attempting to have a young boy kiss his tongue, suck his oh, tongue. Oh yes, it's a very common Tibetan pastime. <laughs> That and you know turning uh, the the skins of uh, peasants into pottery. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, what we have now is a very dark section of our show today. Oh dear. On the and you're the perfect person to promote it. <laughs> I think to front this Look. on the uh, long history of the human rights industrial complex engaging in widespread sexual abuse. So charity sex scandal. Uh, in this community, no one gets food without having sex first. This is a early 2000s scandal um, that implicated 40 NGOs and organizations and nearly 70 individuals. This is mm. that, that those figures come from the uh, UNHCR, which actually suppressed the uh, the their 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 full report on on this scandal in all more than 40 agencies and organizations and nearly 70 individuals. Okay, and then we have tackling exploitation. Um, the scale, this is, this is in this article here, the scale was truly shocking, implicating some 70 predators, 40 child victims, and 48 aid agencies, uh, and involving the most egregious abuses, humanitarian workers demanding sex from children in exchange for desperately needed aid and supplies such as biscuits, soap, and medicine. The allegations spanned several refugee camps hundreds of miles apart in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra, Le Sierra Leone. Um, this is from the New Humanitarian here, um, the article I have up. And from the UK Parliament. Hmm. Yes. Um, well, I mean, yeah, th I mean, this is just absolutely shocking. Um, and it seems to be a very, very, very widespread phenomenon, like pretty standard. So here we have in this in this UN Parliament report, uh, agency the, who, the top uh, you know listed offender is aid uh, workers, agency yeah. workers. Uh, the exploiters are mainly men in the community with power and money, including agency workers from local and international NGOs as well as UN agencies are among the prime sexual exploiters of refugee children. Uh, often using very humanitarian assistance and services intended to benefit refugees as a tool of exploitation. Male national staff were reported to trade humanitarian commodities and services, including medication, oil, bulgur wheat, plastic sheeting, education courses, skills training, school supplies, etc., in exchange for sex with girls under the age of 18. The practice appeared particularly pronounced in locations with significant and established aid programs. There was compelling evidence of a chronic and entrenched pattern of this type of abuse and refugee camps in Guinea and Liberia in particular. Again, this is early 2000s. Allegations were documented against a wide range of organizations and individuals as they emerged unexpectedly but systematically during the course of the study. The number of allegations documented, however, is a critical indicator of the scale of this problem as altogether 42 agencies and 67 individuals were implicated in this behavior. The breakdown of these figures by country is as follows. Liberia, 11 agencies and 26 individuals. 
Sierra Leone, 13 agencies and 24 individuals. Guinea, 18 agencies and 17 individuals. Confidential lists detailing these allegations were submitted to the UNHCR as the mission was ongoing. This information is derived from discussions and interviews with approximately 40 separate sources comprising of both groups and individuals. Um, this is, the following is from the same report. I'm not gonna scroll along as I do it. I just, I took out sections. The exchange rate for sexual services is extremely low. The girls usually get a very little money, if any at all. For example, in Liberia, the girls were reported to receive the equivalent of 10 US cents with which they could buy a couple of pieces of fruit or a handful of peanuts i.e. not a full meal. The majority of those affected were reported to be between the ages of three months and 11 years. In Guinea, the study team was told that in one of the camps, a girl who was HIV positive was given a lethal injection so that she would die. Oh, dear. So, and then we have from The Guardian. A fuller 80-page version of the report, which listed the aid agencies alleged to have employed people suspected of abuse, was suppressed by UNHCR. The Guardian has obtained a full copy. It accuses two British charities, Merlin and Save the Children, of employing staff who allegedly abused refugee children. A spokesman, well, whatever. Workers for UNHCR and uh, the World Food Program are implicated in similar abuse allegations, along with people working for such NGOs as Medicine Sons Frontiers, Care, Action Center, La Fame, and International Rescue Committee. So, International Rescue Committee, this is an organization I've written about before. International Rescue Committee, uh, currently led by former UK labor leader David Millibrand. The supposed charity pays Millibrand one million a year while he hobnobs with Gulf Royals and promotes the destabilization of Syria. This is when Henry Kissinger was still alive and Henry Kissinger and Madeleine Albright were listed as overseers on the IRC's website. The IRC has honored Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest asset management firm known for its ties to the oil, oil industry and defense lobby, with a humanitarian award. According to Eric Chester's book, Covert Network, Progressives, the International Res Rescue Committee, and the CIA, throughout the Cold War, the IRC acted as an essential component of the Covert Network, the interconnected set of organizations helping the U.S. intelligence community to implement a variety of clandestine operations designed to destabilize the Soviet Union. Next we have from the OIG, speaking on ties to the CIA, <laughs> the International Rescue Committee, this is the Justice Department actually, uh, agrees to pay $6.9 million to settle allegations that have performed procurement fraud by engaging in collusive behavior and misconduct on programs funded by USAID. Um, USA's OIG conducted investigations into Turk in Turkey into allegations that IRC staff participated in a collusion and kickback scheme with a Turkish supply ring, which included bid rigging, bid rigging activities in the selection of goods and services contracts for cross-border humanitarian relief in Serbia, uh, Syria. Um, and I have the OIG report here. The OIG report notes that the IRC. In some instances, IRC did not conduct supplier due diligence as required. IRC did not always check references, conduct anti-terrorism checks, conduct site visits, or validate key information in proposals. So they're just, you know, not vetting basically Al Qaeda yes. and giving them contracts. Of course, that's what that's what we learned there. Kim Charles is, of course, the patron of the IRC, named in 2020. Yeah. And just a few days ago, IRC tweets, we're delighted that His Majesty King Charles will continue as our patron. Yeah, I mean, he's also a, a repeat donor to GCHQ, um, interestingly, um, <clears throat> and goes to, uh, has rather disturbing photo ops at their headquarters with little children. Um, I, I mean, I think that, that they're, they're, it's been deleted from the internet now, of course, but it's a very interesting um, uh, talk that James LeMessurier, the White Helmets chief, who we went in, we went into him uh, a bit and his rather mysterious death last week. Um, he gave a talk, I think it was in 2015, where he was talking about how if you look at polls, humanitarian workers in war zones, they have the highest levels of trust by far, uh, far more than militias or um, 
uh, even healthcare workers, it's like humanitarian workers, because um, they are widely trusted by populations because, of course, they're often the lifeline by which um, citizens can, in desperate need, can receive water and food and, and all sorts of other um, uh, life-saving uh, aid. Um, and so, of course, the, the, this is well understood by the intelligence and security services of of the Five Eyes and elsewhere, and of course they try and exploit this um, for their own for their own purposes. Um, I, I I I'm shocked that we haven't seen a white helmet style group in Ukraine. Although I mean I do I've seen some leaked documents. Everyone's a white helmet now. Yeah 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 I've seen some leaked documents which tend to suggest that the British were attempting to set that up uh, a, a kind of comparable yeah. organization um, in Kiev. Uh, for propaganda purposes, because of course these th these people appear um, in the media to be helping children get out of rubble, um, etc. Uh, where the white helmets of Gaza are, um, I don't know. But there's an <laughs> yeah, the, the, so it's it's quite we see where people's priorities lie. Continuing with a brief history of NGOs, human rights NGOs, and humanitarian aid organizations. Engaging in widespread sexual abuse, we have from the Ebola crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo, this is around 2015, we have nearly two dozen women in the De Democratic Republic of Congo have come forward with allegations of sexual abuse by aid workers during the Ebola outbreak. Uh, 22 women have said that they were sexually exploited or abused. Uh, acts included alleged rape and unwanted pregnancies by male aid workers responding. Uh, <laughs> And we have, just let me pull up my show notes. Uh, the men offered them jobs in exchange for sex, identifying themselves as working for ma major aid organizations. Three of the seven organizations named are UN agencies led by the World Health Organization, which, which features in 14 of the claims. So World Health Organization in 14 of the claims in the Congo against uh, 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 of sexual abuse of, 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 um, of refugees. And, people suffering from the Ebola oh, crisis. Uh, Oxfam, Oxfam also involved. We have via Africa News, their suspension, uh, this is Oxfam. Um, 22, I'm sorry, a letter was sent in February by 22 of the British NGO's current and former employees outlining inappropriate behavior and harassment, fraud, nepotism, and sexual misconduct by 11 staff members, including directors. I mean, it's no wonder that West Africa is moving towards the Russian sphere when they keep getting raped by the British. Yeah, indeed. Well, I mean, it's there's that great quote, which is uh, every time the, the Chinese visit, we get a hospital. Every time the, the British visit, we get a lecture. Um, I mean, they also get rape as well, right. <laughs> it seems. Yeah. Um, and of course, the, 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 the circulation of that quote has led to a large number of uh, British economists and political pundits saying they would be better off with a lecture. Uh, so, um, um, death by a thousand self-inflicted cuts, I think, is the order of the day for the West. Yeah. But I think as well that the um, <clears throat> uh, it, 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 the the there are, the Peace Corps, for instance, in the US, um, this has always had like an intelligence gathering component. So it's the the use and abuse and exploitation of humanitarian groups as a guise for far more sinister activities yeah. is uh, quite um, quite well established. There were several people, when um, t uh, ISIS started kidnapping um, Westerners in, in Syria and Iraq um, and beheading them publicly, a lot of the, the time, um, apparently they, 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 were more, they were looking more for aid workers than they were even journalists, because yeah. they were like, well, you're a spy. Yeah. But that was <laughs> that was the assumption, yeah. um, and yes, the, there is a there is a, a guy called Peter Kasig. I've written about him. Um, he is uh, he was uh, an an American. I think he was a military vet um, who was um, uh, he went to Syria in twenty thirteen. Or is it 2012? Um, and he actually, it seems, had a legitimate desire to l connect children in occupied, uh, sorry, in, in opposition occupied areas with with healthcare and education and that sort of thing. And um, he ended up working for a company called Arc, which is a um, it is a British intelligence cutout run by a longtime MI6 officer. 
um, uh, called Alistair Harris, it engages in all sorts of arm's length skullduggery for the British government all over the world. I mean, there it's they get hundreds of millions annually from from fulfilling British government contracts, and their staff are all ex military and intelligence people. And um, Kasig, it seems, started worked for them. Um, for six months from October 2012 to um, uh, the, the, the April the next year. Um, and he um, left um, apparently in uh, acrimoniously and was apparently, according to his sometime Syrian girlfriend, uh, not fond at all of ARG and thought had a, a wide variety of concerns and suspicions about what they were actually doing because they claimed that they were an aid sure. um, a, 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 a provider um, and uh, then yes he he gets he gets kidnapped and then subsequently beheaded very publicly by ISIS um, I the the timing is quite interesting because 2013 is when ARC starts effectively laying the foundations for British uh, uh, direct British intervention in Syria. In September that year, there was an, an alleged chemical weapons attack in Ghouta, um, which um, it, 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 it could well have been staged by opposition elements in conjunction with ARC. And then there was a parliamentary vote subsequent to this on direct British intervention, which didn't succeed. Um, but if we assume that that Kasig's um, distrust and, 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 and suspicions about ARC were probably that yes, that they are here to cause trouble and, and trigger yeah. intervention, it may well have been necessary to take him out of the game. Yeah. Um, and it, there is, a, there is a, 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 a contributor to the cradle called William Van Wagenen, who wrote a very interesting piece about uh, James Foley, um, the, the American who was beheaded by ISIS. And he ma makes a very obvious point, which is that um, the people who killed Foley and, and 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 a lot of the the kind of the very eager ISIS head choppers were British. They entered um, Syria via a pipeline set up by this MI6 in order to funnel extremist fighters into the country. And they went while in Britain. They were part of an extremist group that was heavily penetrated by MI5. So, I mean, James Foley was writing um, very critical things about the Syrian opposition, saying, well, it's actually all foreign and it's all extremist groups. There, are, there is no moderate, domestic, kind of homegrown domestic opposition. Yeah. Um, so, again, um, it raises the obvious question of whether he was deliberately taken out for um, exposing inconvenient truths. I could believe it. Um, moving on with the uh, sexual abuse scandals over the years. Yes. Um, so we have the Oxfam whistleblowers receiving death threats and int intimidation. We have, in, from the AP, internal documents show the World Health Organization paid sexual abuse victims in, Con uh, in Congo $250 each. Um, earlier this year, the doctors who led the World Health Organization's effort to prevent sexual abuse traveled to Congo to address, the effort, uh, to address the biggest known sex scandal in the UN Health Agency's history, the abuse of over 100 local women by staffers and others during the uh, deadly Ebola outbreak. In Chad, again, we have Oxfam, new allegations uh, of staff involvement with prostitutions after claims that employees at a second country mission had used sex workers while living on the organization's premises. Oxfam in Haiti, other side of the world, uh, the group lived in a guest house rented by Oxfam that they called the Pink Apartments. Uh, they called it the whorehouse, said one source, who was known, uh, who says he was shown phone footage by one of the residents of the guest house. They were throwing big parties with prostitutes. The girls were wearing Oxfam t-shirts, running around half naked. It was like a full-on Caligula orgy. It was unbelievable. It was crazy. At one party, there were at least five girls, and two of them had Oxfam white t-shirts on. Uh, these men used to talk about holding, quote, young meat barbecues. The United Nations in Haiti. What else happened around the time of the earthquake? Uh, well, the UN, UN troops lured kids, children, into a sex ring. Uh, from 2004 to 2007, nine Haitian children were exploited by a child sex ring involving at least 134 Sri Lankan peacekeepers, according to a UN report obtained by the Associated Press. Often the children were given cookies or a few dollars in exchange for sex. Although 114 of the peacekeepers were sent home, 
None were ever jailed for the abuse. Mm -hmm. Justice for victims is rare. An Associated Press investigation of UN missions during the past 12 years found an estimated 2,000 allegations of sexual abuse and exploitation by peacekeepers and UN personnel around the world, signaling the crisis is much larger than previous known, previously known. Again, that is the UN itself. It is not aid organizations. What, what else did the UN do in Haiti after the earthquake? Well, they introduced cholera, UN admission, UN's cholera admission, and what comes next? Scientists and researchers have repeatedly found, this is via AP, uh, with overwhelming evidence, I'm sorry, New York Times, overwhelming evidence uh, consensus. that consensus that UN peacekeepers introduced the disease to Haiti for the first time ever, recorded by knowingly allowing their infected feces to slow through the Meal River, which locals use for drinking, bathing, and washing in violation of the UN's own protocols and the most basic tenets of public health. Yet for six years, as thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of Haitians died painful, degrading deaths of dehydration from severe vomiting and diarrhea, the world's most important international humanitarian organization destroyed, dissembled, and when all else failed, stonewalled. What else happened by aid agencies after the earthquake in Haiti? Well, how the Red Cross raised half a billion dollars in, for Haiti and built six homes. That's via ProPublica. And it's nice work if you can get it. Just to wrap all this up, as we see that there's been widespread sexual abuse after earthquakes, after disease outbreaks, after war, we have right now, if you go to the UNHCR's Poland website, there is a portal for reporting sexual abuse by humanitarian workers. Final thoughts? <laughs> Final thoughts. Um, I mean, I'm speechless, yeah. like, in a, in a sense. I mean, I mean, it... It is. It, it, it's. 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 It, I think, as we've discussed before, it's like when, when something is so widespread and it keeps on happening. It's not a bug. It's a feature, right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the, the it, it's it's difficult to get into the mindset of someone who would join an aid agency specifically to carry out sexual abuse. Although I'm sure it is very widespread. And again, I mean, it, I think it really drives the point home that. That humanitarian aid might be a happy upshot of what they do, but it is not their actual purview. They are concerned with doing something very different. Yeah. And I think that's it for all we have to cover today. Sorry about the depressing topic at the end there. Uh, yes. But I think that it's a huge story that uh, has received uh, you know, very little coverage for, uh, as, as we've shown how widespread it is. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. We hopefully have some standalone videos coming um, outside of the regular podcast. Um, and we will see you next week, potentially live, potentially not. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, always a pleasure.